So our schedule for today is listed on my screen. We're starting with a talk by Dr. Caleb Kibbett on open science, followed by a workshop by the Frictionless Fellows, and we'll end with a panel discussion on ethics and open access of research data. And I put our code of conduct in the chat and I can put it in there again right now. And we are committed to creating a welcome environment for everyone by participating in this event. We expect you to agree to our code of conduct. If you have any issues during the event, the reporting mechanisms are in that link, but you can also reach out to me in the chat via private message if you have anything urgent that you wanna discuss. And our chat room, um, please use the chat if you have any questions or if you wanna give a virtual round of applause to the speakers. I will be moderating the chat along with the fellows who we will introduce to you later. And I'm going to ask everybody to stay muted for the entire event unless we ask you to unmute, for instance, if you want to ask a question. So we will be starting with Dr. Caleb Kibbett's talk and after his talk, we will have time for questions at the end. And without further ado, I'm going to do a quick intro of Caleb. So Dr. Caleb Kibbett is a bioinformatician at the International Center for Insect Physiology and Ecology in Kenya. He is an ex-Mozilla fellow and will be speaking to you today about his work in open science with a talk titled, Open Science, Leaving No One Behind. We're really excited to have Caleb here and I will stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Caleb. Caleb, let me know if you need me to change it so that you can share your screen. All right. Uh, yep. Thank you, Lily. Looks like it's good. Uh, thank you all for the invitation. I hope you can all hear me correctly and well. Can you hear me well? Okay. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, the invitation to uh, present today on the Open Data Day uh, with the Frictionless Fellows. And I just want to say that it is uh, quite a pleasure to, uh, to do this and to just share my experience in open science and uh, what we've been doing in open science to uh, build awareness and of course also to uh, equip our students and researchers with the open science tools. So I will be speaking on leaving no one behind and ensuring that open science, as we promote open science, uh, and especially since open science is generally being promoted and uh, most of the time being led uh, by the scientists from the global north, we want to ensure that no one is left behind, especially uh, those who are mostly affected by the closed uh, nature of research that's currently ongoing, uh, especially the concepts of open access and so forth. So, uh, I'll start with this quotation by uh, John Tennant, uh, address this all, uh, who say that open science is just science done right. And really it's not a new and a foreign concept, but it is science done right. What this means is that it means that we, there's been a move away from science being done right towards a close nature of science and practices that are not conducive for science. And that's the reason why there was a need for the open science practices, the need to promote open science within the scientific community. And of course, the aim there is that we can be able to return science back to the time where we can just say it is science, not open science, but just science, not open research, but just research. So, and uh, uh, if you look at this uh, image here on, uh, and it covers the concept that I'll be talking about, the concept of open access. And really, you get to see this beautiful, and uh, the title of the, of the paper maybe is really good, and it could actually be an answer to your research questions that uh, are more or less the problem that you had with your research. And you see that these are really interesting research, especially if you look at the abstract. But then deep, I wonder what it means. It's a paywall, Fred. And really, that shouldn't be uh what is going on and i think this is from the open knowledge foundation also uh going to the aspect of data so i'll be talking about yeah, a lot about access and data and 
Uh, this is the captain saying that all gotten yet show that show where the data is, but I can only detect poor visualization. And that covers the concept of when it comes to uh, data sharing, as much as the data could be online, it doesn't mean the data is open. It doesn't mean that the, the data is accessible. And we'll talk a little bit about the fair data uh, principles. So, but first, I just want to introduce myself. And uh, I've used this image of myself uh, on a hike. And this day, actually, I was not actually hiking, but rather we were mapping a trail uh, that we want to take people the next uh, weekend. So there's an aspect of trail mapping and I've been involved a lot, a lot about uh, with trail mapping, especially in, in Nairobi. And, uh, and I'll be using the principles of hiking and a bit of trail mapping when, uh, during this presentation. But first I'll introduce myself uh, as a bioinformatician and hence most of my, my open science advocacy has been uh, to the bioinformatics community within Nairobi, Kenya. I'm the founder and a project lead of Open Science KE. And I'll also talk about the why I got into Open Science a little bit in, in, as part of this introduction. And I did my PhD in bioinformatics in uh, South Africa. And when I was in South Africa, I got introduced to Open Science principles and the practice of research in an open and reproducible manner. And hence, I practice some of most of those principles in my research, uh, uh, publishing open access, using open peer review, uh, making sure my data is available and accessible. Uh, and when I came back to Nairobi and got involved in uh, teaching and research, I realized that there was a barrier to the practice of open science here in Nairobi, Kenya. And I'll, uh, the premise for that is, if you are the only one who is practicing open science and uh, practicing open research, then you haven't achieved your objective, especially if you have to collaborate, you have work to work with others, because if you are the only one, then you are not going to reap the benefits of open uh, science. I'm also, so I'm, I'm a lecturer at Kwan University and Jomo Kenyatta University. I've been an Eli's ambassador. And recently I got to be part of the at the Dryad Scientific Advisory Board. Uh, also Mozilla Fellow recently just completed and my focus was on uh, research data management. And I'll talk a little bit about that in this presentation. And currently I'm, an, uh, I'm a wrangler uh, within the openness space as part of the Mozilla Festival that is actually starting on Monday. And, uh, and of course I've said I'm a hiker and a trailer, uh, trail mapper. So, I'll plug this in here uh, to just request those who are, are interested to join us for the virtual Mozilla Festival that's starting on the, on the March 8th. Uh, so we have uh, fantastic sessions at the open space, so covering from open data all the way to generally the concept of openness in advocacy and uh, internet openness. So please uh, do get your ticket, uh, they're still open. Uh, so please uh, go online, to, just search Mozilla Festival 2021 and just get your ticket and uh, choose some of the presentations you'd like to attend. Uh, if you have any questions, just reach out to me and I'll uh, be able to ask you. Uh, there are some questions that I've uh, always been uh, reflecting upon and it's been a change from when I started the advocacy in open science. And at the very beginning, my interest was to just sensitize on open science and ensure that there is adoption of open science practices. But as I continued with this, I realized that there is a need to understand what really, what open science means uh, for an African researcher. What does it mean for me? Uh, what does it mean for an African academic or research institution? And that would, actually influence the kind of uh, advocacy and awareness practice uh, training and awareness that you need to undertake to be able to onboard those who are not aware of those practices into practicing open science. Because uh, the barriers that exist in different contexts uh, are different. And since they are different, we need to be aware of those uh, context of the context and how we can be able to ease the adoption of open practices in those particular contexts. So those are the questions that I ponder about. The other one is, how can we control the narrative and develop policies and practices that work for our settings? And 
Uh, the reason for this is that I've experienced some barriers, especially when you're dealing with uh, uh, more or less senior researchers and uh, lecturers when it comes to open data and open science practice. So think, for example, about the constraints that exist in uh, Africa and other resource constraint settings. For example, lack of funding and the need to format your data for openness. So there's a cost implication to all these practices, but then uh, when they have different priorities, you would not be able to uh, more or less convince them that this is something that's urgent and important for them, especially since uh, their worries, their worries lie elsewhere. So I'll cover a little bit about this uh, as we go along. But first I'll go back and introduce the concept of open science and what it means, uh, especially uh, looking at the aspects of leaving no one behind and uh, open data as a whole. So this is the practice of science in a way that you can be able to collaborate, uh, especially others can be able to collaborate and contribute. And the focus here is that the research data and the lab notes, which is considered to be scholarly contribution, are freely available. So there's the aspect of freely available, but it's not free except when there is uh they, they that is done under terms that enable enable reuse redistribution and reproduction uh and that's really important so for that to be open scholarly contribution uh so reuse redistribution and reproduction of that research and its underlying data and methods and as i go along i'll uh expound a little bit more on some of those aspects uh highlighted there uh, but first, let's have a look at the high level taxonomy of open science and uh, open data. This today is open data day, and I think the focus is a whole lot on, on open data. But there are other aspects of uh, open science that do exist. So, for example, the aspect of open access, uh, which is almost directly linked to uh, open data as well. Uh, we have open and reproducible research. and. This is very important for researchers to ensure that uh, their science and whatever they do is reproducible. Others can be able to uh, reproduce the output or replicate their research uh, process. And that requires uh, ensuring that the methodology, the use of open lab notebooks, the use of uh, literate programming, sharing uh, code and everything, uh, code and the whole uh, methodology on uh, open platforms. Uh, there are aspects of uh, open, uh, various aspects of open science tools which are necessary to support the process of practicing open science. And uh, many of these uh, exist, uh, bibliometrics and so forth. Those do exist and we'll not go into uh, those in this presentation. Uh, but our focus would be on open access and uh, open data. So, this really is the premise of uh, my own, the reason why I, I practice open science and I promote open science and I train on open science. You cannot be an efficient scientist until you and your collaborators are aware and equipped with the open science tools. So not only awareness, but equipped with the open science tools. That's really important when it comes to the practice of open science. And that's the premise where uh, that's the reason why I'm talking about leaving no one behind when it comes to open science. So other benefits of open science is that the reason why we practice is that when all researchers are aware, uh, not just those who are in developed world, not just those who are in the computational space, not just those who uh, may seem to benefit the most from it, or, uh, but everyone, uh, leaving no one behind, everyone is from the uh, established researchers to the early career researchers, uh, from those in developed world to those in uh, developing world or uh, lower income countries, all when they are all aware of open science practice and not just awareness, uh, they are trained and supported in all the various stages of their career to practice open science then we can be able to see the, the, the benefits. So you can see that there's the potential to change the way research is performed. When everyone, when all that are involved in the scientific research process are equipped and aware of these practices, then we can be able to create that scientific ecosystem where now 
research gains increased visibility, which is what's important. Uh, research is shared more efficiently. And of course, research is performed with enhanced integrity. When all these are achieved, then I think we'll have, uh, we'll be able to reap the benefits of open science. So uh, those who are interested in going into more detail about the benefits of open science can have a look at this paper, uh, the point of view paper, where how open science actually helps researchers to succeed. So the benefits of open science first is to the researcher and then next to the scientific community. Uh, so please do have a look at that when you can. Uh, but let's go into the more sort of paywalls and impact factors. And uh, there's this general uh, statement that uh, uh, in 2010, and I don't know what the, 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 the data could have uh, a bit and change, but generally there's been a very huge uh, profit margin when it comes to the LCBS uh, profit compared to even uh, most of these huge uh, companies like the Apple and Google or even Amazon. So there's science and scientific publishing have become uh, a business. Uh, and that's where now there's uh, the move towards more democratizing uh, research, not just research production, but also uh, research output and ensuring that everyone involved is in that process. And the reason for that is that the measure, which was the concept of impact factors, started becoming a target. Uh, so we started uh, rigging and uh, hacking our way to ensuring that we uh, can publish on the high impact factor journals or when it comes to when it comes to the publishers themselves, they only accept papers from a particular group and so forth, just to make sure the impact factor remains high uh, within their journals or within their uh, their publications. So when it becomes a target, it's easy to be a good measure. Uh, it, it's no longer a measure because it's now a target. So, and that's why now there's a move towards now other options, preprinting, open access, uh, uh, become a necessity. But if you look at it, you'll see there's lots of uh, uh, lack of honesty when it comes to the practice of open science. So for example, someone who published on open science now and they're doing a systematic review of uh, what it is and what it means, but then they publish that in a closed journal. And yet, if you look at the abstract there that's provided, they're talking about open science, it's transparent and accessible, uh, shared, yet uh, this is not accessible that uh, they've shared there. So there's still a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, I'm wondering, maybe it's because it's in a journal of business research, making research into become a business. But the paper is just an advertisement. So when it is an advertisement and it's not accessible, then uh, that's not a good advert. An advert should reach uh, as many people as possible. An advert should be easily accessible, easy to understand, the message should be uh, clear. But when the, we are publishing in closed access journals, then that is not the case. It's not accessible and uh, cannot reach everyone. And you can see uh, this cartoon talking about the fact that uh, this, uh, this guy is signing uh, and talking about the fact that uh, the taxpayer is paying for the research, uh, but you have to give the paper to a journal. And then we need to fund you again to read your own publications. And uh, that really should not be, be the case, not just to the research that is being funded, but also to the intent of research. We're doing research for it to be accessible, for it to benefit those who uh, we want to reach. So when it is in a closed uh, or uh, more or less the paywall, and there's a paywall, then that is not achieved. The reality is that the article there is just, especially when it comes to computational uh, research, it's just the advertising. It's not a scholarship. The scholarship is that software environment, the code and the data that produce that result. That is the scholarship. So that being the scholarship, it means then uh, the data or the paper itself should be published in an open access. But then also it means the data should be shared fairly. And when you talk about fairness, there is, should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So someone should be able to find where that paper is being, has been published and just being able to find it. But also not just finding it, but it should be accessible, uh, being able to access that. Uh, that paper, the format in which all that other data, uh, the format in which you've shared the data should be 
interoperable. So you should not use a uh, proprietary format that uh, that someone needs to pay for those to be able to publish. And then the last aspect there is reusability, uh, which means that you should attach a license to your data that allows for reuse. And that license there not only defines how the data should be used, but also protects the data generator uh, from any malicious use of the data. So when that happens, then when it is shared to enable and support reuse, and the focus there is reuse, then you would have enhanced value of the data that has been uh, generated. And here I want just to put a caveat here that uh, fair data is not really equal to open data. Uh, there is the need to be as open as possible and as close as necessary, depending on the kind of data that you are generating. So the data can still be restricted, but fair. Uh, open data, in essence, is just a subset of all the data that has been shared. It's not the whole. Uh, and then finally, fair data should protect the privacy of the data subject and also um, should protect the data generator, especially when you're dealing with uh, uh, researchers who generate the data, they still want to derive some value from that data, then they also should be protected uh, in the process. So there are some a number of repositories. Uh, this is not exhaustive that uh, someone can use to make their data open. And most of these repositories enforce uh, those fair principles and they support or promote those fair principles. So have a look and see if you can make use of one of these in your work. So the code, so we talked about the data and the code. The code is the scholarship. So, so that you're talking about now the, the software environment that generated the data, the, the results. So that's, this is just a cartoon that talks about uh, when someone goes, when you when someone comes to you and says, hey, can I use your software? Sure, just grab the, the code from GitHub. And the other part is where it's closed. Hey, can I use your software and there is help? Someone wants to look at my messy code and that really uh, leads to the fact that of course, uh, when the code is only developed for one person, then the, the coding practices or the, the software practices will not be followed as a whole. Then when there are errors in that code, it means no one would be able to identify them. Even when there are errors in the research output, no one would be able to uh, identify those. So when it comes to being able to interrogate the research, output, then there's a need for that continued and uh, complete openness. So Open Science Equips, uh, which is uh, Open Science K, which is the initiative that I came and formed in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, to equip researchers with the Open Science tools. And we use this model, Open Science K model, which uh, starts with sensitization. So the number of aspects, sensitization. So you sensitize your target audience through seminars. So we held a series of seminars in various universities and a research organization to just uh, make the researchers aware of the practices of open science. So this is open science and this is what it means and this is what it means for you. And then the next step is to train them. So training a subset of those uh, researchers to practice open science and that needs uh, the training on the open science tools, the tools that they can use to uh, practice those, uh, to, to practice open science. And then the next stage is to continually promote them to uh, to encourage them now to use those tools that we've trained them on. And we held a series of workathons as well, which uh, were focused on answering some of the research questions of interest uh, within our community in Kenya. How open is scientific publishing here in Kenya? What, how are we practicing, for example, uh, the use of preprints in uh, scholarly, scholarly sharing uh, scholarly uh, output. And then the next step was uh, we collaborate also using now the collaborative writing tools on GitHub uh, to write a paper on that. And the other aspect is just continued building of communities through meetups and uh, uh, seminars and continued uh, uh, giving more or less talks and presentations in various spaces. So, that's the model that we use, and we had a GitHub uh, page which we use for most of our collaboration, generating most of our research output uh, within that. So we also developed, uh, so during the hackathon, one of the aspects was that here in Nairobi, or here in Kenya, most of the, some of the institutions require that the students publish before they get the MSc. 
uh, but then there's also the need we are here promoting the need to publish open access publishing open access there's the need to pay the article processing charge that is not usually possible for most students who do not have funding for their research so how can they still publish open access but at low cost and we uh, generate a resource which contain a list of uh, publishers who allow or give waivers or subsidies to students or people from lower income countries and we also provide them uh, more or less a guidance on how to access that uh, data uh, we also uh, our paper that we worked on uh, on open science in kenya where are we uh, we published that initially shared that as a preprint using the africa archive and here we are quite particular on the kind of on the preprinting server that we use uh, using the the African archive was to just promote the African, making sure that African research output is shared within some of these African uh, platforms in as much as they are they're still hosted in uh, an African platform, but then at least we are promoting uh, this platform. And then uh, I've also have a keen interest in open uh, personal data protection and I recently I wrote an article in the conversation on how the personal data protection law that was recently passed and is now in the implementation stage could affect researchers and that's uh, uh, right there and but if you look at where we are in uh, now shifting to contextual open science we see that uh, they still we still lag behind in Africa in most of these aspects uh, even when it comes to that personal data protection laws uh, that has been implemented in very few countries and most of those laws require that when it comes to sharing data you have to share data with countries who have similar laws uh, implemented and when that's not the case then that could be a barrier to uh, to science the other aspect if you look at uh, where we are in africa and when it comes to open data uh, we're still quite behind compared to most of the other countries and for most of the countries there's no data even available uh, as, as to where we are so if you look at all this it means that how we approach uh how we promote open science or how we uh, approach open science in africa would be different what it means for african researchers is uh, really different and as much as this has claimed that we are generating less research output it may not be really true because the reality is that uh, there is lack of feasibility when it comes to uh, the research output uh, from the African researchers. And these are some of the things that uh, platforms like the African Archive and uh, some of these initiatives are trying to promote to ensure that the research output generated uh, within Africa are actually uh, they increase feasibility, feasibility uh, for those data. So the reality is that is it's mainly due to difficulties of accessing that uh, data. So African published research papers have been underutilized, undervalued, undersighted uh, in the international and African research arena. So there's a need to change that narrative and how to change that narrative would be to be part of the conversation and the solution to changing that. So not just uh, being uh, uh, the process of just awareness and so forth, but just trying to have that conversation, that candid conversation. What does it mean for us? So, what does open science mean when you talk about resource, resource constraint? So, this is clear that they lack government funding, uh, there's very little institutional support. So, if you talk about open data or sharing your data, then there's need for uh, our open, more or less, uh, research data policies within the institutions. When those do not exist, how would the researcher now practice open science where there's no pro policy in which they can plug their uh, practice upon uh, the lack of funding the lack of funding means the priorities would be different they would be more interested in uh, spending the money in uh, things that would lead to direct research output and then uh, for students of course the demand to publish or perish uh, there's the need to follow the advisors the need for open science and so forth so all those uh, would influence how we practice or how we promote open science. For established researchers, they have the power. And as much as some of the concept may be foreign, they have the power, they have the tools, uh, and as much as the tools could be at demand, they have the power to support those who can, uh, because for them, there will be less of a uh, research ca or career cost to them when they uh, go against the traditions uh, compared to 
when it's an early career researchers, uh, then the, the, the cost is a bit high uh, for those. Uh, so for researchers in limited, investing in data management infrastructure is a luxury and the cost of preparing data for sharing and archiving is prohibitive, which means that how we approach uh, the process is different. So for example, focusing on uh, promoting the uh, metadata would be more important as opposed to a focus on sharing data from the word go. So uh, I worked on this research data management framework, which focuses on uh, developing, uh, being able to guide the researchers to uh, guide the researchers to more or less one develop the policies for the institutions developing a data management plan. So all the whole research data life cycle uh, when it comes to sharing metadata, so metadata management. Uh, and then uh, some of the guidelines for resource poor settings, how they can uh, store their data. So when it comes to research data infrastructure, and then the training on tools and uh, practices. So leaving no one behind, I'll just go now and I'll say as I went down uh, on lessons from hiking and trail mapping uh, uh, on research data. So start small. I think the small hills to prepare you for the mountain. So there are small things. So for example, uh, starting with ensuring that your research data, uh, what, through your research uh, process, your research data is well managed. Uh, so proper data management. So as opposed to research data sharing, which has barriers. So data sharing would have barriers, but data management is no barrier. No one would stop you from uh, preparing your data and managing your data well, capturing all the meta metadata and so forth. So that would be in a process that if you need to share your data, then you are in a position to do that quite uh, easily. Have a plan open by design, not by default. So open is not just uh, by default, just going into it without a plan, but there's, need, there's a need for a plan uh, on how to uh, achieve openness. And then be a trail mapper, uh, create pathways for others to follow towards the summit where there's a beautiful view. Uh, it will take some time when you are hiking and climbing a hill, it's a lot of work, but then when you get to the summit and you get to enjoy the benefits of open science, then I think that's where you can uh, appreciate the process. So be inclusive and supportive, so the barriers and challenges exist, but we can all get to the summit if we work together and support each other. Uh, that's where, where some of these practices, and I'm, uh, I just want to commend uh, the frictionless data group and the fellows for the work that they are doing in easing the process of adoption of open data practices, and that's really uh, important work that you are doing. So my hope is that future generation will look upon the term open science as a tautology a throwback from an era before science woke up, where open science will simply become science. And the closed and secretive practices that define our current culture will seem as primitive to them as alchemy is to us. Thank you so much for your attention. Those are my acknowledgement. Uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. That was a really amazing presentation. Please, if you have questions, ask them in the chat. And I will start off. Um, that was amazing, as I said. There were a lot of really great resources and tips that you shared. And I'm wondering if you had to pick one to tell early career researchers or people early on in the open science journey, if you had one practical piece of advice, what would that be? Uh, so when it comes to uh, the practical piece of advice is that uh, the start small and start now uh, aspect. So through the research process, don't worry about, so think about the summit, don't worry about the hill and the summit, worry about the steps that you're taking now towards the hill. So take those small steps one step at a time. So for example, proper data management as you do your research, start with that. Uh, uh, using literate programming tools or uh, more or less reproducible tools that is starting now uh, before you get to the bigger challenges of uh, data sharing and data publishing, the cost of that, the cost of publishing open access. Those are challenges that are in the future, but start where you are in the things that you are currently doing. Practice open science then, uh, and each of those steps would open up uh, opportunities and ways to practice open science for the next step. So what you do now, 
prepares you for the next step. Thank you. Paula, would you like to unmute and ask your question or would you like me to ask it for you? I can ask it, yeah, we'll be happy to. You had a really nice resource, uh, uh, an RDM framework, this cycle. It was, uh, I like the components and the simplicity of it. Uh, where is this uh, framework from? That is the first question. And what is the status maybe in Africa of this framework at universities, for example, are really working on all of these aspects? Did they start it somewhere specific in this framework? I would be just curious to know what is going on there. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, so. This is from the work that I did as part of a Mozilla fellowship that I just uh, completed. And uh, when it comes to the practice, so one thing is that uh, through the research, you realize that very few academic and research institutions do not have uh, research policies or research data management policies, which is an important foundation uh, to open data and data sharing and generally uh, the principles of open science. So the first step actually for this would be, uh, and I've been, we developed uh, more or less a tool that, uh, or an approach that allows these research institutions to develop a research data management policy easily, because most of them do not have uh, the expertise to develop this policy. So it starts with uh, trying to understand where you current, where they currently are, and then through a series of questions, then they can get a template or more or less get a starting uh, a starting research data management policy from that. And then the last step would be now a quick, uh, a quick session, which involves around five of the main or more or less the decision makers to be able to go through the draft that has been generated based on that. So the idea is to generate a research data management policy within a short time and without the need for uh, having people who have the expertise and so forth. So I'm, I'm currently uh, supporting one of the universities here in Kenya to develop their research data management policy using that approach. So all these are the steps, uh, but we are currently focusing on the research data management policy stage uh, to ensure that there is a policy which would now uh, open up the pathway for uh, research data sharing in the end. And, uh, all the Thank you. Yeah. Nice work. Thank you. Okay, our next question is from Evelyn. Evelyn, would you like to unmute and ask it, or do you want me to ask it? Um, uh, I, I wanted to know exactly which challenges you had to face when forming Open Science KE, because uh, what I know about uh, the system in this country is that uh, Open Science KE is like one of a kind. So you must have run into a few issues while you know, preparing to form such a group. So please do tell. Uh, the major challenge was, especially when it comes to universities, there's always a strong barrier to adoption of anything new, especially given that uh, I was not fully in the universities, but rather I was an outsider since most of my work uh, was at the research institution and not within the universities. So when dealing with most of the departments, there's, there's always a barrier to, okay, we want to come and give a seminar on open science within your institution. And the biggest barrier was, uh, we don't see the benefit for this. Uh, uh, we don't have uh, more or less time for this, or this is not a priority for us, and so forth. And uh, so, getting to getting the buy-in from senior researchers and scientists and lecturers was a bit hard, and that's why I decided to go the bottom-up approach, focusing on the students and the uh, the early career researchers, and they're the ones who actually uh, they're still malleable, I would say. Uh, so they're still interested in adopting new practices and they can be able to start influencing now their supervisors. So when it comes to research, research data sharing and so forth, then they are the ones who would influence their supervisors to now practicing uh, open science. So those are, those are the barriers and that's how I approached it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. 
and this is from Pradeep, and I will read it out loud. You have mentioned that for some of the established researchers, open science may be a foreign concept. What are the initial steps to pursue them for letting the early career researchers encourage, encourage in their open science journey? What tips would you give to early career researchers in having a discussion with established researchers to work together to be more open? Uh, I'll go back to contextualizing open science and its practice. Uh, so if you look at uh, for senior researchers, and the, the concern is valid when it comes to, especially if you look at the aspect of data sharing. For them, that's their currency for generating more research output. For them, that's what uh, has built their career. So when you tell them that they need to share this data, then that may not be uh, something that they would buy into. But then if you tell them that there's something of benefit to you, so being able to sell it as a benefit to them, not the benefit to the community first, start with what's for, of benefit to them. So making it when the data is well shared and there's proper metadata and so forth, then it's easy for them to, uh, when if they are publishing and there's uh, correction that are required, it's easy for them to just get that correction done very quickly because the data is well managed, there's a reproducible pipeline and so forth that's available. Uh, so those were one of the things. Uh, what are the initial steps the to the early career researchers? So for the early career researchers, uh, I think they are the ones who are more or less like in the limbo, in the middle of it all, because uh, for them, they need to publish and publish fast. They still need to, there's still the demand of uh, impact factor and so forth. So uh, the first thing is for them to, uh, and this is a really difficult question, I, I would say, uh, in the open science journey, I think I would go back to the start small and just do it small. And uh, the other things that have a higher cost when it comes to your research career, don't work on those for now. Focus on the things that you can do now that have a less of a cost and uh, work your way to the more difficult things. And sometimes if you are willing to go against the grain and just uh, be the trail, uh, the one who creates a trail, then I think that would be also fantastic. Uh, but just choose what works for you. Thank you so much, Caleb. We are out of time. There is one more question in the chat Caleb, I'll ask you if you have time and you can stay with us, if you would mind answering it in the chat, please. Um, can we get a virtual round of applause for that amazing talk? Thank you so much. Thank All right. you. Sorry, I just added your spotlight and meant to remove it. Okay. Next, we are going to have the Frictionless Fellows give their workshop. And I'm going to ask the fellows to turn on their videos now and Kate will be sharing her screen to get this workshop started. I'm going to be spotlighting each of the fellows so that you can see them. Perfect. All right. I think that this workshop is going to be a really nice segue after listening to that talk. Um, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you that joined us a little bit later, welcome to the workshop. I will re-input the link to our code of conduct in the chat. By joining this workshop, you are agreeing to participate in our code of conduct. It's really important for us that we're creating a welcoming environment for everybody. And without further ado, we will get started. You can see on this first workshop slide that there is a link to the slides and everybody is going to need that link. You can put it into the chat here as well. And you will need this link because these workshop slides are interactive and we will be doing a hands-on portion. If you have questions during the, during the workshop, you know, either 
questions while we're speaking or questions during the hands-on portion, please put them in the chat and I will be moderating that chat um, and we can try and pause and help you with your questions. Okay, next slide, please. So I'll give a little background about the Open Knowledge Foundation. This is a nonprofit that is focused on making all information open. So we're really striving for a fair, free and open future. And part of what we do is we build communities and tools and skills to help people open up all sorts of information, but also use that information. And part of what we do is work on the Frictionless Data Project and work with the Frictionless Data Fellows. So can I have the next slide, please? What is the Frictionless Data Fellows Program? It is part of Frictionless Data, which is an open source project where we are focused on opening up research data and making that data more reproducible. It has many similarities to data science and it's really focused on like data cleaning steps, the steps that you need to do to make your data usable. And as part of the Frictionless Data Project, we have this fellowship where we are working with early career researchers to try and teach them the frictionless tools and specifications, including things like coding and they're writing blogs and they are helping build up our community. And really they're becoming advocates for open science and best practices in data sharing and data management. So that's what we'll be talking about today are some practical tips for managing your research data. Next slide, please. And I am going to stop talking now and give, hand it over to the fellows who will introduce themselves and then take over for the workshop. Thanks so much, Lily. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Anne. I'm a master's candidate in anthropology and sociology at the Graduate Institute in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, for my fellowship, I've been working with open data from the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. And um, I'm always keen to uh, improve data literacy in my own communities. Hi, I'm Kate. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. Uh, my focus is I look at the human microbiome in the context of prostate cancer. So I work with a lot of data, and I guess I'd call myself a bioinformaticist. Hi, everybody. I'm Evelyn Knight. I'm a master's student at uh, ICPE, International Center of Insect Physiology and Ecology in Nairobi, Kenya. My focus is on morphometric and genetic diversity, um, checking of uh, insect pollinators on avocado farms in Muranga County, Kenya. So welcome to our presentation. I'm going to start. Kate, please, may you give me the next slide? So the objectives of this workshop is to introduce you guys to the frictionless data tools. That's the data package creator and the good tables. Uh, these ones are to just enable people to uh, manage their data better by putting all the metadata and converting into easy to use formats. And also to communicate the importance of good data practices and metadata. Next, please. So at the end of this workshop, we are hoping that all of us will be able to create a data package using the web app that Kate is going to show us. We should also be able to create a schema file and use it to validate a data set using trygoodtables.io, which will be shown by Anne. And uh, we should also be able to uh, handle common errors in frictionless data workflows. Next, please. So the data set that we are going to use is mine. And uh, I collected this, uh, it's a pollinator data. And uh, we are focusing on pollinators because uh, recently, we have noted that there's uh, a lot of uh, there's a lot of loss in uh, pollinator communities, especially in the global north. And this could be because of the anthropogenic factors that have led to loss of habit habitat for these precious insects. So um, also, uh, in in it, it has also been shown that insufficient pollination has often led to decline in production. 
And uh, this is really uh, stressful because uh, the main pollinators of most food crops are insect and uh, the index in which uh, the, the, the index of that production is about a third of all food crops that you depend on are uh, pollinated by insects. So when, this, when these uh, creatures go, we are also going down with them. So it's very important that we start uh, conservationist policies and stuff to just conserve the little that we have. So uh, we collected insects from avocado farms. And uh, this is because Kenya is very, it's very, uh, it's one of the biggest producers of, avo of avocados uh, all over the world. It's about number five or six. And uh, most of this uh, production goes to exports. And this is very important because the exports really earn the country a lot of foreign exchange. Some of the data was also collected in Tanzania. Tanzania as well uh, is a very high producer of avocados. And it's also important to check just how much uh, the, they, they have uh, when it comes to maybe pollinator communities because these two countries are neighbors. Next, please. So uh, we collected uh, the pollinator data from smallholder and light scale avocado production zones in Kenya and Tanzania. And uh, this these uh, our production systems, uh, the smallholder are, consist are consisting of avocado trees, which are intercropped with other, uh, other small crops like beans and legumes, and also fruit trees like, um, like mangoes. We also collected from light scale orchards where they just uh, avocado monocropped in large tracts of land. So the, the samples were, were collected by uh, the use of sweep nets and were conserved in alcohol. And uh, in the laboratory, we, they were uh, identified by use of morphological cues, like um, the number of wings, the number of body parts, coloration, how many uh, antenna they have, and uh, this was aided by the use of uh, identification keys and also uh, the identification was done under a microscope. So the data that was generated was in a tabular format and this included the sites of collection, um, the, the number of insects collected per site and also because we were able to identify them, we found out uh, five orders that is uh, Diptera, Coleoptera, Heteroptera, Hymenoptera, and uh, Lepidoptera. And this was computed in a tabular uh, file and put in GitHub where Anne and Kate were able to access it for the next part of this talk. Cool, thanks Evelyn for introducing your data. So for this first part of the workshop, I'm going to take Evelyn's data and we're all going to create a data package from it. Uh, and then I will be handing it over to Anne and she will show you how to validate such a data package. So what is a data package? Uh, well, it's a simple format that allows you to place your collection of data all in one place before you're able to share it. Uh, we like to think of a data package as kind of a container so the metaphor that I always say is, say you're grocery shopping and you buy all these different things. Um, and an easy way to keep track of them is to put them all together into like a grocery bag. So in this instance, the data package is kind of like a grocery bag where you're kind of holding all of your different things. Uh, a data package is typically made up of three different things. It's made up of your, typically your raw data. So this would be like a, a CSV file perhaps, or some kind of tabular data. Um, the second part is metadata, or that's essentially information or data about your data. So it kind of gives context to your experiment. Examples of metadata would be maybe where you collected your data or who collected it or different time points. Uh, so that's, that's what metadata would be. Uh, and then the last part of your data is your, uh, your schema, which is essentially the structure of your data. So if we go back to the tabular uh, or is it a number? Is it a date? So why use a data package? 
well, if I go back to that earlier metaphor, it's, you know, when you go grocery shopping and you have all your purchases in your hand, you can easily drop something. But instead, if you put it all in one place into a container, it's a lot easier to transport. Um, this can be really helpful. So uh, oftentimes when you decide to send your data to someone else, um, things can accidentally get erased or perhaps some of your data can be changed from like a time format into a number format. Um, so a data package can kind of help you keep track of all your different pieces. Um, also really helpful in a data package is you can add a license. So this can give context to when you give your data to someone else, you can say, well, this is how I'd like my data to be reused. Um, essentially, the whole point of a data package is to make it easier for researchers to put their data all in one place and then also allow others to use it. Uh, we are going to create a data package using a web browser today or a GUI tool. Uh, which stands for graphical user interface. However, there are other ways to create a data package and that can be using programmatic interfaces like Python or R. And those are available in case you want to include this data packaging process in your already created workflow in those languages. Um, the output of a data package is a .json file. So that stands for JavaScript object notation. And it's a minimal readable format for structuring your data um, and it's really helpful because it's machine readable and interoperable, which if you remember is part of the FAIR data principles to be interoperable. So let's take a look. This is what the data package creator looks like. This is what the web browser tool is. And it's created of three different panes. In the first pane, we have um, this metadata. And up here, we have these three buttons. The first one is so that you can upload your data. Um, so say you have your data on your local computer, you can use this button to upload it. The second is a validate button. So this is really helpful when you're finished making your data package, you click this button and it tells you whether or not you filled all the required fields. And lastly, we have a download button. So again, once you're finished and it's been validated, you can download your data package right onto your computer. Uh, and then we have uh, the rest of the metadata. So you can add things like a name for your package, a description. Um, you can even add a place for your own um, website. And then down here that's not shown, you can add licensing and even um, keywords, which can be really helpful for you to find your data package in the future. Uh, in the center, we have this resource pane. So right here, you can add, in this example, I'm actually uploading a file from my computer, but you can also add um, a URL from if, you're, if your data is hosted online, like at GitHub. Uh, and then each of these boxes is actually a column of your data set. So in this first column, we have country, and you can specify that um, all this, this data type is a string, but you can also decide, you know, is it an integer or a date? Uh, so you can really specify, uh, this is where the schema comes in, you can specify uh, the organization of your data, the structure. And then on the right, we have a preview of what your data package looks like. Cool. So next, uh, this is actually hands-on time. So hopefully you all have the slides pulled up. And if so, you're going to click on this data tab. Hopefully everyone can see this. If not, either say something or uh, people are monitoring the chat um, and they will help you. So that link goes to Evelyn's GitHub uh, where her data set is hosted. So let's first take a look at what we're dealing with. Uh, so again, we have this tabular data set. Um, we have eight columns. So that's something good to take note of. And then also the data types that are within each column. So in the site column, we're seeing that these are words. So we're probably going to want to keep in mind that these should be strings. OK, and then in the rest of the columns, it looks like they're all numbers. Oh, I should look in the chat. Cool. Awesome. So hopefully everyone's following along. Uh, all right, so to use this data in the data package creator, we're actually going to have to click this raw button. So hopefully everyone sees at the top of this uh, data set a little button that says raw. I'm going to linger here over this button. And then you're going to click on this button and it will actually show the data in you know, what we're calling the raw format. So this is actually what the CSV file looks like. 
if you notice, everything's separated by a comma. Hopefully everyone's here. If not, please say something or ask a question. And then to be able to use it on the data package creator website, we're going to have to copy this link. So everyone copies the link to the raw data. Give you a second. Then we're actually going to go back to the slides and make sure that we open this create.frictionlessdata.io. And that's going to open up the data package creator. Cool. Um, and then we're going to in the path field. So if you see at the top, there is path. And we're going to paste that link here. OK? So everyone can paste their link in this path field and then click load. Cool. So if we look, it should, the data package creator should have inferred, hey, the data has eight columns, which is true because when we looked at the, the data earlier, that's what we saw. But then we're actually gonna click this and it's gonna populate all eight of these columns. Gonna move this up a little bit. Cool. So I need to move everyone's faces briefly. So if we click these three little dots here, we'll see that, oh, look, the JSON file is already populated as well with these eight columns. Um, something that you always want to make sure you do when you're creating a data package this way is make sure you go through and check the data types in each column. So we're seeing site. OK, it should be a string. That's correct. Um, looking through, these can all be integers. They could also be numbers, but integers is fine for this. Cool. Um, you can also add a title and a description to each column. So maybe you want to put a little more context, a little more metadata to what each of these things mean. So in description, I could add, you know, site of, right? And then if you look to the right, description, site of collection should populate here. And uh, something of note that we're not going to do today is you can actually add resources manually. So you don't always have to either upload your data or use a URL. You can actually click Add Resource, and it will allow you to add each of these fields yourself. So that can be really helpful to you if you need to manually ins insert something. Um, make sure to uh, delete those by clicking the little trash can though, because it can often, it can cause a problem when you are validating your data. You can also add fields manually to um, already prepared um, uh, data sets. Hey, we have a question from the chat from Paula asking, should the title follow the name of the column? Uh, it doesn't have to. It can be something uh, more specific to if you want to add a little bit more info, basically. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, something that I also will note is because this data package is, is trying to be machine readable and interoperable, sometimes it has very stringent criteria for naming. Uh, for instance, this, this name function is actually supposed to be, this is part of, um, it needs to be machine readable. So if you look, the, the grayed out words are all lowercase and they're all separated by hyphens. So that's kind of telling you like, this is how it needs to be written. So for instance, if I, if I was like insect counting um, and then I validated my, you know, making sure that everything's right, it's valid. However, if I decide to capitalize something, it causes an error. So this is a really common thing that I mess up all the time in my own work. Um, so this is a really common error of just like, it doesn't match the pattern that's needed, which is lowercase letter. So just make sure to be cognizant of that. Um, something I haven't talked about yet is when you scroll down, you can add all these licensing agreements here. Um, something that I like to do a lot is add keywords. So like insect, add keyword. Uh, 
Kate, we had a question actually about does the, if the data set always has to come from GitHub and whether or uh, not the process is different if it's saved on your local hard drive. It does not always have to come from GitHub and no, it's not different. So I guess the only difference is you would um, click load. Sorry, I don't know if you guys want to see my desktop, <laughs> but you can click load and then it will or um, and then you can pick something from your computer. Thank you for reading the questions, by the way. <laughs> cool. So it's really nice too, because when you update any of this, it shows up in your preview. Cool. So again, before you download it, you want to make sure you validate it. And so this is checking that all the required fields have been filled out. There are a bunch of different things that you can add. Um, I'm kind of showing you like the minimum that you need to fill out a data package. Um, we had another question asking if there is a size limit to the data that can be packaged with the tool. There is. I think, Lily, correct me if I'm wrong. I thought it was like 10,000 rows or something. It's pretty large. Um, wow, there's a lot of things going on in the chat. It was just me saying oh. yes. Is that Lily agreeing with you? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's about 10,000 rows of data. Um, so it's pretty broad. Um, Okay, and then the last thing you do is download. And if I open it up, I actually don't think you guys can see this, but typically it opens up in like a text editor. So mine opened up in Sublime and um, then you have your data package. We have a, another question, which is yeah. what if I work with personal data? Is it safe to use the GUI? Ooh. That is a good question. I think, I don't know if Lily has a better answer. Um, I think I would be wary of doing it. I don't know, maybe I should let Lily answer this one. It's a really good question. And I'm trying to think what's on the back end to think how secure it is. Um, I, I'm going to have to get back to you on that. I'll try and look at it while the fellows are talking and give you an answer, but I might have to get back to you afterwards. I think I personally would not, but I'm very wary of any, you know, something that could be PHI. Um, especially for me, a large function of the data package is to uh, upload it somewhere and put it, you know, maybe on GitHub or so. I wouldn't use um, patient data, but okay. Let's go. Hopefully, everyone is doing okay. One more follow up question. Sure. So, you can use the Python pipeline locally? Yes. You, yes. I believe you can. Yes. Um, so, we uh, at the end of this, we will actually have a bunch of links to um, the documentation for uh, the various ways that you can use Data Package Creator um, and, and all the other frictionless tools. So there will be more um, info you can get about this at the end. This is kind of, uh, you know, 101, how to use this Data Package Creator. Cool, okay. Uh, I guess we're kind of going through the questions. Back to the slides. Uh, so how is your data package useful? I went through this earlier, but it's essentially a container to hold all the different pieces together and to kind of make it easier for you to keep track. Um, it's, it's easily shareable. It has, you know, gives context to all the different pieces of data and your experiments. Um, it's, you know, the whole point of it is to make um, data easier to reproduce as well, because you just, you have all this built-in information. Um, and really, you know, we're just trying to, um, 
kind of make data more fair. So findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, just building on what Dr. Cabet said as well. Uh, so any, any more questions before I pass it off to Anne? I'm actually going to stop sharing so Anne can go ahead and share, but please continue to ask questions. Cool, yeah, as we um, begin the process of changing screens, there's always the, the chance that my computer will explode <laughs> on me or something goes wrong. So uh, please feel free to ask Kay any questions if you have any ones about the data package. Um, otherwise, we'll get started on the next tool in the frictionless toolkit. Cool. Can everyone see my screen? I actually might need to ask uh, yes. Evelyn. Yes. Okay. You can see me okay? Great. Great. Cool. So um, Kate spoke to us today about the frictionless data package and how it makes sharing data sets um, easier across systems and file types. I really liked the analogy that she used about uh, the data package being something like a container or grocery bag that makes it easier to store a bunch of things together within it, uh, give you the context of what you're using, um, but also make it easier to kind of give that bag to other people, give that container to other people and to other groups. Um, but kind of taking a step back, uh, I'm gonna help introduce you to another tool that helps you to check on one um, container, one plastic bag, so to speak, to see if there are any uh, leaking bags of flour or uh, a rogue can of corn or something like that. Um, yeah, and it's essentially, how do you check the quality of one data set? So goodtables.io is a one-time or a continuous validation service for tabular data. That means that, in other words, Good Tables is a tool that lets you do a quick check on your data to make sure that um, there aren't uh, formatting errors or issues that would affect your uh, uh, rows and columns data. While it's a, also a Python library and a command line tool, uh, it's also a web tool. And similar to what Kate was doing earlier, we'll be using the web tool just as kind of an introduction to the Good Tables toolkit. So why is validating data important? The way that I usually try to explain this is essentially uh, validation is kind of the equivalent of spell check. Just like how you wouldn't send an email or an essay or a piece of writing to someone without running it through a spell check system. Uh, similarly, you wouldn't send off your data uh, to another person or to another group without running it through um, a validation service or just giving a, it a quick, quick check. Uh, this helps you to check the uh, integrity of your data for possible errors or corruption. And of course, uh, it also helps you to adhere to fair principles as Dr. QA and Kate were saying earlier. And of course, as with all of us um, at the Frictionless Fellowship Program, uh, we love helping to make research more reproducible, usable and shareable. And Good Tables really helps you to answer the question of is my tabular data valid to use? as we all know that the row column or space uh, could really do a lot to affect your analysis. So Good Tables does kind of two checks uh, upon your data. The first is a structural check. So this is checking for, of course, things like empty rows and blank headers. Um, and the second type is a content check. So this can check for different uh, data types that you're using, uh, formatting issues. One really common one, for example, is that of formatting dates and making sure that they're the same across the entire file. Uh, you can also check for constraints that you've set on the data. Uh, and you do this by validating it against a table schema. So while Kate earlier uh, introduced the data package, um, a table schema is kind of, as you can see on the right side of this, let me move you all really quickly. Uh, on the right side of the slide, you can see an example of this schema. So, uh, essentially, a schema is something that helps you to understand kind of what the format and content of that file can be. Um, and by validating it against this schema and not against the entire uh, data package, for example, uh, you'll be able to see if you know rows and columns match up, titles, uh, content type, et cetera, match up to um, what the schema says. Um, it's really important that the schema aligns with the frictionless data package principles. Otherwise, it might throw an error and you may have issues in that direction. Um, cool. So very quickly before we try the Good Tables tool, there's sort of four ways to, to use it. 
online. So the first is to upload a file directly or to upload a link directly to your file. As Kate was doing before, uh, it's important to use the raw version of that data. Otherwise you might not be able to get the kind of analysis that you want or to, to check it properly. Uh, the second and the third and fourth way of, of checking it would be to directly link your GitHub account or your Amazon S3 account to uh, good tables. I really like this because it allows for me to uh, continuously validate my data as I'm updating a data set or a long-term project. Um, but today we'll be doing a one-time check. Also really uh, a really important thing to note is that uh, Good Tables actually supports multiple tabular formats. So everything from LibreOffice to Google Sheets um, to Excel files, it has support for a bunch of different file systems. So it makes it much easier to use. Um, and I'm, again, I'm going to plug the uh, automatic validation for your data set because uh, just like how I would never manually turn on a spell check for a document, uh, it's really nice to have that automatic validation system for any data set that you're using. Cool, so um, before we start using the actual tool, uh, this is a preview of what it looks like. Uh, here on the left side, you have uh, the source file or the source, uh, where you can upload, sorry, the file or um, add a link to the source. Uh, you also have a same, similar sort of system for a schema. Um, and the format and encoding here is essentially helps good tables to understand uh, how they should be reading your data and your schema as it uploads into the good table system um, or reads it. And then finally, we have these two options for ignoring either blank rows or duplicate rows. Uh, this is just to make sure that, you know, as good tables looks at your data, that it doesn't make the mistake of accidentally rendering an error uh, because you might have added something on purpose, like a blank row or duplicate row. Cool. So you can learn more about it uh, in the documentation, but uh, let's get started on trying to use it. Great. So click on this link here. This is great, Evelyn. I feel like we're all your, Kate and I are your research assistants this afternoon. All right, so I pulled up a, uh, the data that Kate was working with before to make the data package. Uh, this time we'll be validating this data to make sure that it is all aligned with what she wants it to be. Great. So as before, uh, make sure that you're clicking on the uh, raw version of this data here. Otherwise, uh, good tables may read the entire page and, and throw an error, not uh, be able to check the data properly. Uh, I trust that Lily is sharing the links to both the data and to good tables, just to make sure that everyone's able to access it. Great. So similar to the process from before, um, I'll be grabbing this link directly of the CSV file that's um, just uh, strings and numbers separated by commas add the source here. So we'll do, we can do actually a quick check of this data and to check for quick structural things that aren't validated against a schema. So these are things that uh, GitHub can, or good tables can check without um, any sort of external validation. Um, looks like Evelyn, this first check went through. Sorry to put you on the spot, but looks all looks great on this end. So let's grab the, oops very quickly and then we go to the repository. Great. So we are going to look at the schema that she kindly made for us today. I really honestly love the, the data package and the schema system because as someone that wasn't familiar with Evelyn's research before, uh, looking at her uh, data package and looking at um, the kind of data about the data actually helps me to understand it um, more, not coming from a background. Cool, so as from before, we'll grab the schema, a raw version of it as a JSON file. Great, so we'll grab this link here. Uh, let me know if I'm going too fast or too slow uh, to make sure that I'm matching everyone's pace and that you all feel comfortable. Great, so uh, just for the sake of ease, we'll use the, auto, uh, the automatic system here. So um, good tables would be able to check it for us, putting you on the spot here, Evelyn, and it looks like it's valid. But 
in the interest of making things a little bit more exciting, uh, we're actually going to do an air that I have done um, many times when I first started using the frictionless toolkit, which is actually inputting the entire data package as the schema. Um, when I first started using these tools, I didn't realize that the schema was kind of separate. I had trouble kind of distinguishing between uh, the data package and the schema uh, as different kind of components that you could use. And so let's see what happens when you use the data package uh, to validate your data or everyone's data in this context. Great. So grab her data package here. Grab the wrong version of this data. It's a little bit of a Tetris system with this video because I'm it's always blocking a button or something. So I'm moving it around the screen as I present to you all. Cool. So let's see what happens when we add the schema to, or add the data package to try and validate Evelyn's data. And it looks like it threw an error. Um, so what's really handy about the Good Tables tool is that it actually allows uh, gives you kind of a description of uh, common errors that you might get. And so when I saw this the first time around for my own research, uh, I realized that the data package that I was using to validate it wasn't valid and that I would have to be using the schema, data table schema um, on its own. And so this is just an example of one of the errors you might get. Um, you can also visit the good tables documentation to look for other types of errors and to see, for example, um, as shown here, uh, if your, um, your labels or your data types might not match up with the schema that you set up for it. On my end, I think that that's, uh, if anyone has any questions about this tool, anything that I can review, uh, please let me know. There's a question in the chat that's, do you create the schema yourself? Yes, so I would say, at least in the process that I have followed for it, um, is that there is a format for making your data schema Oops. Uh, that you do. So essentially you can use, um, I would recommend using the data package tool and then actually grabbing a selection of that, uh, the schema section of that data package. So for example, in Evelyn's, um, in Evelyn's data package, it would be grabbing this part of the data package, um, which would be specific, more specifically the schema part. Um, and this has you know, the title, the description, all of the information about her tabular data that you would be able to use to uh, validate that actual data set. Yeah, so using the schema or the, the data package that we just made um, in when I was talking, <laughs> it's, you'll see that there's like a little schema um, section that Anne has highlighted. And so then you can take that and usually make a separate um, file. Yeah. And I'd say something that we actually discovered the other day uh, was that naming system is actually very important. So make sure that when you're, uh, you're, when you're naming your schema or you're naming your data package, uh, making sure that the formatting is standardized because it makes it easier for, for good tables or for data package to read your file. Do you have any other questions? Anything we can help you with? Maybe actually, Kate, uh, I wonder if, um, yeah, if we want to add, if anyone has any questions about either the data package or- There's a the question. Tables. There's a question. Somebody got an error. Maybe if you can go to the chat and. Uh, I wonder, uh, Kevin, if you did you click the raw button to grab the. I was going to answer you in the chat, but we had a loading error. Oh, interesting. I, I, co I copied the link from the chat, so maybe that was my mistake. I'll, I'll try doing the raw thing. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a, definitely a mistake that I've uh, made before and actually sometimes continue to make where it's important to get that raw, the raw version of that data set or of that schema um, by clicking the raw link if it's a GitHub file. Um, otherwise, it might try to analyze that entire web page. Cool. 
Got it. Thanks, Ann. No worries. Cool. So I think in the interest of time, uh, we'll pass, pass the mic back uh, to Evelyn as Kate and I, her research assistants for this afternoon, uh, she'll get to explain about what happens after you use good tables and the data package and with your um, data. Take it away, Evelyn. Um, let's talk more about your research. Thank you, Anne, and thank you also, Kate, for uh, creating the data package and validating it for me. Actually, I don't really mind being put on the spot in the interest of open data. It's really wonderful for me to sit back and uh, see my data being tossed around after working on it for a long time and being so familiar with it. It's good to see it in other people's hands. And uh, I think that's what open data is all about. So I, I thank you. So um, this data was analyzed and actually we, we produced a paper based on that just uh, a few weeks ago. So we found out, out that um, the common, the most abundant pollinator group in the two countries were the Hymenoptera, which is actually mostly the bee group, but this also consisted of, consisted of wasps and uh, you know, the bees were quite diverse because we had the honeybees and then we had uh, stingless bees that were actually uh, just being found in uh, the Tanzania region. We also found uh, uh, solitary bees, which are quite rare because you see for uh, agricultural areas, there's a lot of digging and, and, and spraying of chemicals that have interfered with their with their habitats. So it was really interesting to find that in Kenya, we had solitary bees alongside, hymen, uh, alongside honeybees, while in Tanzania, we had stingless bees alongside honeybees. That was a very good thing to see. We also found very diverse groups of the diptera, which are the fly groups. The one that is shown here is a hoverfly. And as you can see, it kind of mimics the bees that are in the first photo. And we call it genetic mimicry. They kind of tag along with the honey. They forage where the honeybees forage. It's a very good phenomenon. And that just make them find food. They don't really have to suffer. They just follow the bees. And we also found a, a very wide uh, group of uh, Lepidoptera, which is the butterfly group. So we can say that the, the pollinator communities in uh, the studied parts of Kenya and Tanzania was quite diverse which is actually very good for us when, uh, because now, you know, uh, a lot of pollinators of different groups, that means functional complementar complementarity that will increase the, the efficiency of pollinating behavior. So aside from the entomology, you can actually, if you find, if you want to find more about these findings, you can uh, follow the link that's provided below. I've actually just uh, shortened it to the word link down here. And you can have a uh, no PDF, uh, no downloadable uh, format, but you can just read it there. You can find more about these creatures and maybe follow my work also. I also have uploaded a part of this data on GitHub. And uh, next, please. And in the spirit of making this data fair and uh, shareable, uh, I've already embarked on the, the project with my supervisor to make it more uh, visible by indexing it and uh, putting it up, all of it on GitHub. And uh, this, please. Yeah, and uh, just the, the goal of all this is just to reach out to the communities outside there. We found out that pollinator data in Africa is not really uh, that much. We want to build uh, a whole website of pollinator data from Kenya, Tanzania, Ethiopia, and also to find how, out how just, just how much we can improve our agricultural systems by maybe complementing the natural pollinators with beehives and, and practicing, uh, making agricultural practices that are sustainable for increased production of even other crops aside from avocados. So thank you so much for listening to me talk about food because who doesn't like food? And uh, thank you so much for listening to all of us. 
uh, give this workshop. So if there's any other question or any comment, please, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Evelyn, Kate, and Anne. There are some questions in the chat. Um, the first one is for Evelyn from Paola. She would like to demo the tools. Is it okay to use your demo data? Yes, totally. Uh, this data is already there and free to use. Kindly go ahead. And then Paola also requested, Anne, would you be willing to show the continuous validation integration with GitHub? I think we have time to do that if you um, we put you on the spot, but I think no, you're- <laughs> Absolutely, as someone that asked uh, or pitched it a couple of times to the group, I'm more than happy to share. So I actually, here, let me see if I can get out of full screen. All right, so, um, so I'm actually logged in right now to my, um, through my GitHub account to Good Tables. Um, so going to the dashboard here. Um, uh, so I actually have one, uh, my uh, ongoing project on the Universal Periodic Review Data. Uh, tied directly into GitHub. Um, so essentially, uh, the process here is that you log in or create um, a, if you have a GitHub account or account that you use to store your data, especially if it's an S3, Amazon S3 or a GitHub account, you can log into Good Tables using that information and then choose the, um, choose the repository that you use uh, to store the data that you want to be validated um, and then you'll be able to see if it's valid in real time. And so I wish, let's see if I can, it might be a little bit too complicated to um, change something in the data, um, but let's, I'll show you just a rough idea of what a repository looks like. Um, so the idea being that the data package that I have here um, and the data that I have here, um, all of these CSV files are being read uh, in real time by good, good tables. And so uh, there was a period where it actually not saved my CSV files uh, with the UTF-8 encoding. And so all of these rendered errors until Lily helped me to catch the error, I resaved that data. Um, and then almost immediately, uh, good tables was able to, to check it all out for me and then um, I was good to go. As you can see kind of here on the right, uh, clearly a lot of errors going on. And then in the past month or so, have been able to format it correctly. I don't know if that made the things a little bit clearer, uh, but essentially it's integrating a, an account that you have with a data hosting service and then um, good tables being able to read that data for you. Are there any other questions for our fellows? <laughs> yes, Paola, please ask. <laughs> Sorry for all my questions, but this, I find it super interesting and very motivating that young researchers are looking at these things and working with these things. So yeah, congrats to you and thank you for transferring all the knowledge. But I would like to know, why did you get started exploring this? Was uh, the incentives came from your supervisor? It was a friend, it was, how did you start to investigate and apply all these things? What did encourage you to, to look at these things? Evelyn, as our uh, <laughs> PI, I think you should take the question first. Okay. Um, before before I came to Frictionless, I had no clue about open data. I had no clue about open data tools, but when a colleague forwarded the, the call for the Frictionless fellows is when I started now digging up, like knowing what GitHub is, 
And I found out that it was really important for my research because, you know, after master's, then there's PhD, and then, you know, you'll find some donors, they want you to maybe uh, publish in open access, maybe they want maybe open data knowledge as, you know, as, uh, as an added advantage for maybe in the eligibility criteria. So for me, I'm always, um, I, I always want to build up on what I want. I always want to put myself in the forefront of, you know, everything, kind of have something different from the rest of everybody. And then I was, so when I saw the call, I was like, you know, this is something new, this is good. So <laughs> I joined, plus the fact that I was going to interact with people from a lot of backgrounds, that was just like, you know, like dangling meat for me to follow you. Yeah. So this was my incentive my supervisor was totally unaware until i told him dude i'm going to be given an interview is when he was like oh you mean that you know it worked out yeah but the good thing about uh the environment that i work in is that it is very uh it is very encouraging for any other thing that you might want to do alongside your your dissertation so when they heard that I want, um, I'm in the fellowship, they supported me wholly. And uh, you find that even yesterday, you know, I gave out like a talk at the student community on open science. So they're always ready for you to give back. They're like, you know, just spend your time over there, but come back and teach us. So it, it is also partly my supervisor's uh, support that has got me this far. And uh, from here, we are now going to embark on a serious campaign at our institute and uh, try to build more open data pathways. And uh, if you've not noticed, Dr. Khaled is actually from my, uni my institute. So with the Open Science KE and with him around, it's really going to be um, a really integrated uh, system when we work together. I think of I've said more than enough. Maybe Kate, if you want to <laughs> talk about yourself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I joined and got really interested in open science and open data, kind of out of frustration with my field. So um, I cannot tell you how much time I've spent, you know, trying to access papers or uh, trying to reproduce data. You know, so I've like I'll be given the raw data, but it's I don't know how they process it. I don't know how they handled it you know, from papers and just trying to understand other people's processes and kind of realizing that there has to be a better way for people to translate, you know, the experiments and the research that they've done. So um, I started kind of looking a bit more into um, what is open data and open science and what does it mean and how can I kind of take some of those concepts and um, transfer them to the human microbiome field uh, so that was really my motivation and uh, it's been really great and now you know I think I was really interested in maybe a postdoc after after grad school but now I'm like maybe I want to get into more open science advocacy so it's it's been a really interesting and fun journey um, okay uh, your turn Anne. <laughs> Um, I guess out of the, the three of us, I'm a little bit of a odd one out uh, as I actually come from a data journalism uh, and almost purely qualitative background. And so I was really interested in, you know, in many ways, the more philosophical ideas of open data and um, the sharing of knowledge more openly. Um, but I kind of found in many ways a tension between uh, the like, qualitative research, ethnography, um, sort of based research I was doing in my uh, academic studies and anthropology and sociology and like tools and principles of open data um, and data journalism um, and journalism more largely the way that it deals with uh, like database practices or or data stories and so I was really interested in kind of learning more how to bridge this gap in a lot of ways um, because I think that you know being able to apply, apply a lot of these tools or a lot of these principles outside of you know, the open science, open data field, which is pretty STEM oriented um, to, you know, my own fields uh, in anthropology and sociology or, or journalism more widely could make, um, could have a, have a big impact. And so, yeah, the similar to what Evelyn and Kate were saying, this fellowship has actually really changed the way that I view a lot of these tools and helped me to sort of bridge the gap between um, these different 
kind of worlds that are worlds that I have my foot in, I guess. Um, so I'm excited to be able to kind of translate these tools to for other people that may be working with data. Um, and in many ways, think of the ways in which, you know, a validation system could also be used for, for other forms of checking data, like um, algorithmic bias, et cetera. How can we make tools like that that are as easy to use across a bunch of different disciplines or across a bunch of different backgrounds? Um, essentially, I'm just passionate about bridging the gap. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our fellows for presenting today. Uh, we are ending the workshop now, but I want to get a round of applause for them. And thank you for your questions as well. And we are going to move on to the panel discussion now. So I'm going to remove the fellows from our spotlight and ask them to shop, stop sharing the screen, please. Thank you. And now I am going to ask our fellowists to please turn on your videos and I will add you to the spotlight. Take me a second to find everybody. One more. All right, we've added our three fellows to the spotlight. You should all be able to hear or see them now. And I'm really excited about this panel. The way this will work is that I will be asking some questions to our panelists and we have 45 minutes. And if we have more time at the end, um, we want the audience to ask questions as well. So again, I will be moderating this and moderating the chat. And again, I am going to put our code of conduct in the chat. Say again that we are trying to have a very welcoming space here and we encourage everyone to participate and follow our code of conduct, please. So without further ado, I will introduce you to our panelists who are going to be talking about balancing ethics and open access research. First, we have Dr. Monica Granados, who is on the leadership team of Pre-Review. We have Cedric Lombion, who is the Data and Innovation Lead at the Open Knowledge Foundation. And we have Douglas McCarthy, who's the Collections Engagement Manager at Europeana. Hi, everybody. And I am going to try and not talk a whole lot and try and let our panelists speak for most of the time. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to our panelists and ask you each to introduce yourself a little bit further for a couple of minutes. And let's go ahead and start with Monica, please. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us and uh, for the Open Knowledge Foundation for this invitation. I am Monica Granados. I am on the leadership team of Pre-Review. Um, I also work as an open uh, science and data advisor for Environment and Climate Change Canada, so for the government of Canada. Um, if you were in that last uh, workshop, there was a question about, you know, how did you get interested in, in open science? And for me, it was going to a similar workshop like this. I went to a workshop at the National Center for Ecological Synthesis and Analysis, and I was introduced to this concept of open science and that we could do science differently than the way that I was being taught to do science in graduate school. Um, and that really um, you know, kind of radicalized me into the open science world and, and open science advocacy. And so I've had the pleasure to um, work on a couple of different projects, including pre-review, where um, we're working with preprints to make peer review more equitable and accessible. And on the government side, um, I, we're working to make the science that the government of Canada does more uh, accessible as well. Thank you. And then can we have Cedric, please? Uh, hi, everybody. So I'm Cedric. I'm part of the Open Knowledge Foundation. Um, so I'm a colleague of Lily, and I am the 
data and innovation lead, which is mostly um, me working on two aspects of our work. On one hand, we have um, a number of data literacy um, activities. Um, so working with a variety of um, audiences from journalists to civil society organizations to governments um, on uh, bridging the gap between um, what they would like to do as part of their work and the data skills that they lack in order to achieve that. Um, and uh, on the other hand, we have other programs more related to um, algorithm literacy and accountability. Um, uh, the, the standard program uh, in that uh, track being the justice program where we are currently focusing on um, supporting lawyers in understanding how algorithms work and how they are, they can be harmful, uh, how, what, what to think about the, the next steps of algorithmic legislation. Uh, and uh, also, we also have some activities related to strategic litigation to, um, uh, well, denounce the current uh, nefarious uses of algorithm in education, especially, but also as well. Thank you, Cedric. And Douglas, please. Hi, everybody. Happy Open Data Day. It's a real pleasure to be with you. Um, I'm Douglas McCarthy. I'm speaking to you from Delft in the Netherlands today. And uh, yeah, I'm the uh, Collections Engagement Manager at Europeana Foundation, uh, which is the or certainly one of the biggest aggregators of cultural heritage data from galleries, libraries, archives and museums, GLAMs, if you like. You'll hear me say that a lot in the next few minutes um, in the world. Uh, I've been in the museum and archive world for about 20 years now. Uh, my background is I have a master's in art history and I've been working in public sector institutions. Um, I've led um, copyright and licensing policy, picture libraries, uh, photographic studios in national museums. Um, I've also worked for uh, small commercial picture libraries. So copyright and licensing and cultural heritage data, particularly images, is really my kind of uh, food and drink, my, my daily diet. Um, I'm really grateful to the Open Knowledge Foundation for inviting me to join all of you today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And I am active in what we call the Open Glam movement, which we'll talk about today, um, which is really about promoting a culturally appropriate uh, open access to cultural heritage uh, with a strong focus on works in the public domain. So um, yeah, thank you everyone for joining today and uh, looking forward to it. Thank you. I'm going to be putting the questions in the chat so everybody can read them while we're going ahead. So the first question I have for you all is, each of you is in a different field, as you just told us. What are some ways that your field specifically is dealing with open versus closed? And are there any ethical issues that you think are specific to your field? So let's go ahead and start with Douglas. Thank you, Lily. Uh, yes, in the cultural heritage or the glam space, there are definitely some uh, important ethical issues which are uh, growing in importance and focus every week. Um, so just to give you a couple of examples, uh, one of them is around restitution of objects, artifacts, uh, material collections in the first instance um, from you know, many different communities and cultures all around the world. So um, freshly announced, I think this week is a project called Open Restitution Africa, uh, which is really about taking an Africa centered approach to data around restitution. And what this is trying to do is recognize the reality that over 90% of the museum held artifacts from African African cultures uh, are held outside of Africa. So I'm sure that you'll be aware this is a really kind of high profile and important conversation that's happening right now. So in the open glam, particularly in the open data space, one of the interesting things to think about is that, you know, we're, often when we come as come forward as data practitioners, we tend to think about um, human and machine readable licenses, copyright, intellectual 
uh, property frameworks. And of course, intellectual property is a very Western construct. It's not something which meshes together neatly and, and sits alongside happily, I think, with um, many kind of cultural permissions and values. So one of the interesting things in, uh, in the glam space right now is, is having a more nuanced understanding of what open means with cultural heritage that goes beyond saying, yes, something that's in the public domain should be freely and liberally reusable, which is maybe uh, most of the assumption from a few years ago. Uh, now it's much more a conversation about, well, how do we join a conversation and bring in stakeholders from um, you know, living communities um, around these objects? And uh, yeah, it's a much more kind of complex, slower and careful uh, conversation. So, thank you. Thank you, Douglas. Monica, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, yeah, I'll speak to this from uh, my background, like my, my educational background and what I was trained in. So I'm a, uh, trained as an ecologist, a, a food web ecologist. And in sort of that specific domain or in, in, in science and like, especially like collection of uh, field data, um, you know, something that the field is, is maturing into is the recognition of um, indigenous knowledge and indigenous uh, data sovereignty. So um, I think there, you know, there was a revolution around open data uh, in the sciences, recognizing how powerful open data can be in terms of reuse and uh, remixing and, you know, going out and getting especially field data can be very expensive and so this idea of like what if we could transform the way that we share data and 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 um, reuse data so that we can sort of lower some of these costs and make it a lot easier for people to access data that can be really difficult to to gather and so um you know, there was this thought of like, well, let's, you know, let's open all of the things. And I think we're now maturing into the recognition that um, open doesn't necessarily mean equitable. And, um, you know, this is data that uh, I personally have not uh, dealt with um, in terms of my, my studies or like what I studied in the pursuit of my uh, master's degree or my, my PhD. But I did work actually on a project where we were looking at um, the mercury content or contaminant content in general in uh, the fishes of Ontario. And um, th this is something of particular interest to indigenous communities, especially indigenous communities in the north of Ontario and here in Canada, um, where um, you know, they are using um, fish as you know, a, a, a larger portion of their diet than probably people who are living in Southern Ontario or you know, sort of south of, of the 60th parallel. So um, when working in that project, you know, starting to recognize that there's different um, considerations that you have to have, especially when you're working with um, indigenous communities and um, a, a different lens that um, as someone who's always lived in the South couldn't, can't possibly understand and why you have to then have um, the participation of communities and the, of indigenous communities so that um, you, you, know, you get that perspective. And also having being sensitive to the fact that like any data that you collect about in indigenous communities or in indigenous communities that's including indigenous land that that just because you have collected it um, doesn't mean that really that that belongs to you. There are very specific um, considerations that you have to think about when you start working um, in indigenous spaces as well. So. Um, you know, I think here the, the important take home for me has been that I think early on in, in my participation in open science and specifically here in open data is that, you know, just because you make something open doesn't mean that that is a good thing and that you have to consider the implications of making things open and why it's important to have, um, you know, sort of diverse experiences at the table to explain what the potential consequences are of making something open, especially when it comes to Indigenous data. Thank you, Monica. Cedric, would you like to add something? Um, yeah, so I, I work at the intersection of open data, data literacy, and algorithm uh, accountability. So um, I, I would 
um, I would say that we have, uh, there are a lot of common issues um, in those fields with regard, for example, to, um, to privacy, um, when, when we talk about opening things, which um, for the most part um, now in the West there's an agreement um, about. Um, there, there are some issues with regard to privacy, there are some issues with regard to um, cap capacity and accessibility of what is being opened. Um, but we are still, uh, for in many cases, um, stuck with some um, um, consideration that where the norm at the beginning of the open data movement, such as a sort of feeling of ownership around data um, that institutions uh, have, um, because it, it to, to some extent, it's the legitimacy and the authority um, that they feel they have uh, for them derives from this exclusive access to that data that they produce, even if it's normally on behalf of um, you know, the, the general public. And so um, that reality is still very much uh, there. And, and so um, although we've made a lot of progress, that is something we still uh, have to tackle and at the same time um, diffuse um, from a technical standpoint and from a uh, cultural standpoint, the real challenge with regard to um, what it means to have something open in terms of risk for um, the population that data talks about in terms of our legitimacy to be the one opening the data um, in terms of, um, well, the, the, the actual risk in terms of data not being anonymized properly, such as, uh, for example, the city of New York a few years back had open um, data around the, the taxi and their trips and some uh, developers found that it was possible to um, find exactly who was doing the trip and identify where some people lived. And so, yeah, so there are, there are some of those issues that we still have to tackle, which uh, for the most part do not um, critically endanger the, the concept of um, the, endanger the need for uh, pushing for more openness, but uh, still leads into resistance and difficulties in approaching um, institutions uh, around uh, opening data or being made transparent about their algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think that's, those are problems that we've been facing for 10 years now and are still there. Um, and the, the main difference I will stop with that is uh, with algorithm literacy and accountability is that um, there are very perverse, perverse incentives in that field that do not necessarily exist in the open data field. Uh, but that very much present in the algorithmic world because of the gold rush around uh, selling those kind of tools to public services uh, that is compounded by the, um, the cuts in the budgets um, of the uh, public services. So that creates, is, creates a, a lot of negative incentives um, that lead to very shoddy implementations. Thank you, Cedric. Okay, we're going to move on to our second question, which I'll put in the chat now, which is, how would you define ethical open access? And can you give us some examples of ethical concerns or reasons why some research should not be open? I think each of you touched on this a little bit, so it'd be interesting to hear you go into more details. And I think this time we will start with Monica, please. Yeah, I think I would sort of define that or, or you know, I would want this a question that anyone who is dealing with open data to ask themselves. And, you know, ethical is a really big term. And, you know, when you start to work with open data, I want you to ask yourself that question and to think about, you know, how can this data be harmful? You know, I, you're, you're being empowered with information and how could that power be harmful? And I think that is, it, that, that is how I would examine the question around ethics for open data is how can this be used to potentially harm people? And there is, um, you know, there's a lot of great work that's been done by scholars on how open data has been used to harm people. And it often is 
people who are already marginalized, um, who uh, you know come from sort of different intersectional uh, lenses, but you know can you know are um, racial minorities or are socioeconomically uh, disadvantaged. Um, often are those who are going to be most hurt by what you could potentially do with the power of data. And so that is sort of how I would frame the, the question of, you know, what is what is ethical data? It's is it it's data that can be used to, you know, forward a goal, but with not with the um, but also not doing any harm. Um, so, so this second part of the question, you know, if there, can I give you any uh, ethical concerns? So I think I sort of touched a, a bit on that. Um, you know, there's a, a great book, um, The uh, Weapons of Math Destruction, that is filled with examples of how um, open data can be used to do, um, you know, to, to cause harm, again, especially to communities that are already marginalized. So, um, you know, there's been examples there about, um, in the book about how, um, you know, they were used to, to rank teachers, how data was used to, to rank teachers to determine who they were going to fire at the end of the year. There's a lot of data about um, sort of policing and how data on policing will often disadvantage marginalized groups, often Black men, um, because of the biases that are inherent in this data that is collected. And so I think, again, open data can be really powerful, but it also can do a lot of powerful, um, you know, in injustice um, because it is biased by humans and collected by humans. Thank you, Monica. Cedric, would you like to add to that? Um, yeah, so um, it, when, when, we, when we talk about openness um, and we, uh, we often have this angle of um, a product that is open, a sort of label that we put on things. So there are things that are closed and there are things that are open and, and I will produce more open data or open papers, etc. cetera. And um, um, I, I like to step back from that and think differently about what open and openness means. And I like to think about it in terms of relationship. Uh, and I think this is something that um, Douglas touched upon a, a little bit earlier, um, because it's not simply about labeling something and saying that is open, but it's also about the process of how do you engage with your stakeholders. And when you um, define this like this, you move away from a sort of um, kind of numeric count of the number of things that you have opened, but uh, a broader, more holistic understanding of um, did you reach out to people when designing uh, the data collection process? Um, did you uh, um, get stakeholders on board when deciding what you make, what you will make use of um, in terms of like um, data sources, um, in terms of uh what how you will publish that data so um that process that engagement is really where openness lies rather than the final product um because um if not you get into in sort of back and forth um with multiple exceptions and infinite exceptions about uh, what what is okay to open but, or what is not. But that question should not be solved after the fact. That should be solved within the process of making that thing. And so that's, that's what openness, um, in my sense, should be about. And thinking about it really helps emphasize some elements that we often forget about, which is um, that there, there is the question of like, uh, are you legitimate to be the one collecting that data? And have you talked to the people? And that extends to, the, to research. So in the fields of um, inter, in artificial intelligence at the moment, we have a lot of researchers, um, very, very um, well-known researchers who have this idea that, well, um, they are researcher, they are researcher and they don't have any, um, they shouldn't commit to think about the potential impact of their work. And, um, and, and for them, they are being open because simply they, pub they publish on archive 
and then um, they are um, the, the data is available and reproducible and for them that's enough. Uh, but very quickly we run into problems when we see that uh, so we test, for example, their um, their uh, uh, their algorithm on a data set that are biased and just assume that, well, you just need to unbias it and we, it will be fine. The problem being that um, when they publish, then very quickly it, the, their new breakthrough or solutions comes to the market even before someone uh, get to try to challenge what has published or, or provide a more co comprehensive solution. And so um, th that happens because there is a lack of this engagement with stakeholders to uh, it also within the research world um, to determine uh, not, not what you should research, but how to improve the way uh, you do that research so that whatever you publish um, um, has less risk to produce uh, negative externalities down the line. So I think that's that would be how I would um, think about it. Thank you, Cedric. And Douglas, would you like to say something about this? Thank you. I think uh, Monica and Cedric covered the ground really well. So I'll make a brief addition, but not too much more. Um, in, in the, particularly in the museum sector, a lot of the focus uh, is around, say, uh, indigenous collections and where the yeah the, the open versus closed debate really becomes i think you know becomes very meaningful is that there are a lot of kind of risks and uh yeah hurt and damage which can be done around um releasing some of this content openly particularly the digital space so if you consider that many of the particularly western museums have you know, source these objects through a number of means, maybe on the open market, so in the art market in the past 50, 100 years ago, through major bequests um, with certain uh, collections and things we know they have been, you know, looted or actually stolen from um, a number of different communities. So it should never be straightforward to have, when you're dealing with these kind of collections to say, ah, well, you know, for example, copyright is no longer relevant or has no place in this conversation, therefore, if we digitize them, they can become completely open and we don't need to think about it. You know, that is just not satisfactory um, because what the risk there is, re is really that in the digital realm, you have a, you sort of reenact a kind of cultural appropriation of other communities' objects. And a lot of this material was never, it, it wasn't created or designed to be disseminated in the way that we as sort of we have quite a sort of consumerist um, approach to museums around public display, now online display. And these can be perhaps they can have sort of sacred um, purposes. Uh, they can be very private. They could be a, a you know, an individual or a, a particular family member or, or a family that these objects were made with by and for, and they, would, they weren't intended to be put on display or put online, you know, fairly thoughtlessly by an institution 20, 50, 100 years later. So the risk really here is that you get this sort of digital cultural, cultural appropriation. Commercialization of this kind of material, um, you know, for example, if a, a particular design or object was, was sort of creatively remixed into a commercial uh, you know, product, a fashion item or something like that, you know, that can also be quite harmful. And so the, the sort of the, the need also the urge to disseminate, which is really baked into GLAMS, you know, that's really part of their institution, their mission and as institutions, uh, there is a kind of very flawed intersection with the ob some of these objects and, and the context in which they were created. So I think ethical open access now in the GLAM space is, as I say, much more nuanced and I would hope there's a long way to go, but becoming much more mindful of these kind of issues, um, whether they're dealing with physical collections or increasingly with the, their di digital surrogates of those collections. Thank you. Thank you, Douglas. I personally had never really thought about that before, like things in museums were not created with that purpose in mind, you know, they might've been created just for that family or something. So thanks for that, that was really interesting. Okay, our next question is, what are some common misconceptions or fears that people have about opening data or research items? 
And I'm gonna ask everybody to try and be a little bit quicker because we are running out of time. And I will start with Douglas because you got to go last last time. So <laughs> we'll start with you. Yeah, thanks Lily. So I've got three points here and I'll be quick. Um, I'm gonna take the, the GLAM perspective. So the institutional perspective for a moment here. Um, three classic fears around open access, open data for museum collections. Uh, number one, um, misuse. So third parties misusing objects, paintings, images in a way which is deemed to be inappropriate by the, you know, the if you like, the, the holders or the owners of those collections. Another one which is related is really loss of control and authority, because uh, you can say, you can kind of imagine as a memory institution, if you have been diligent, diligently for 50, 100, 200 years, you know, caring for documenting, photographing, writing about, curating these objects, the, the prospect of just putting them on the web in high resolution under totally open access terms can be a bit scary for some of these kind of hmm, custodians, guardians, curators. Um, so loss of control, loss of authority about what happens if we go open is a, is a big, you know, is real. Uh, and the last one is revenue generation possibilities or opportunities being taken away through open licensing. Um, this can be a bit of a straw man in that there are very, very few institutions that actually turn a profit on image licensing, for example, in the culture sector. But there always is that kind of deep down feeling that, well, you never know, this suddenly might become a thing and we can make some money out of it. And of course, this is true pre-pandemic, but it's, even much, it's much more true now that uh, the resources and the, the, the budget lines of GLAM institutions are under a huge amount of stress. So revenue generation is, is even further up the structural and political agenda for these institutions. Thank you. Thank you. That was really interesting. Cedric, would you like to go next? Yeah, so Douglas mentions um, like the fear um, the, of losing control, the, um, the fear of misuses. Um, so those are the things I want, would not repeat, but I, I would say that um, around the algorithm accountability, there's this fear of um, blocking innovation um, that it is not coming just from like the kind of marketing materials of uh, private companies, but also coming from politician looking at uh, things moving elsewhere and saying, well, uh, why is the police in my territory not trying to do new things as well? And so um, and the police itself ha is like historically uh, uh, quite bullish on trying new things uh, to legitimate legitimize it, its work. And so, um, and I think that the response to that is, is that it's, um, there are perverse incentives in the current rush toward um, doing algorithm everything. Uh, I mentioned before the, the cut in uh, budgets of various public institutions, uh, which tend to implement predictive uh, analytics, for example, um, just in order to save money rather than in order to properly improve how they deliver their services. Um, so there, we need to change these incentives. And, um, and, and I think the, the, the major response uh, from anyone working in the field of algorithmic accountability is the point is not to stop innovation, but to, um, to have an ethical or proper or, or better innovation uh, where um, when we uh, implement uh, algorithmic decision making, uh, we bake in the system, for example, tools for auditing and for uh, long-term monitoring. But today that is not done, uh, that is not even thought about, and that's uh, this kind of mindset that we need to change. Thank you, Cedric. And Monica? I'll just quickly give sort of the perspective, I think, from researchers and that, the, you know, the scary word there is scoop, getting scooped. I put my data out there, someone's going to find it and someone's going to publish it before me. And um, uh, I'd like to just sort of um, draw a parallel to like the, to the Drake equation, you know, but sort of the opposite. It's like, what is the likelihood that someone will take your data, have the background, have the like, um, you know, the lab space, have the, you know, the, the wherewithal to take the exact specific thing that you work on and then develop it into a paper before you do, given the fact that you've already have this huge advantage um, in the publishing process. 
And so if you think about it, it's probably, you know, the, it's, it's very, very, very unlikely that all of those things, if you think of, you know, um, adding all those probabilities together, you're going to, you're going to come up with a really small fraction. So it's really unlikely that someone would be able to um, take any data that you make open and then scoop it and publish it um, and sort of take credit for it. Now there are of course, are, there is anecdotal evidence that that has happened. And I think we know, especially from like a narrow policy perspective, how powerful these, anec these anecdotes can be to um, dissuade people from, um, from a, a specific uh, behavior. So I think that, um, you know, it's a, it's a real fear in that I think because there is so much value in data and then the publication that comes from data that researchers are scared, even though empirically it's very unlikely that that will happen. But anecdotes from hearing from, you know, I knew a researcher who knew a researcher where that happened to them, or, you know, they might tweet out, hey, this happened to me. And, you know, it kind of goes viral. So I think, uh, yeah, it's sort of like, I, I think it's a real fear, but not actually based on, on evidence, which is sort of interesting from the researcher perspective, because most of them are driven by, by um, data-driven evidence. Definitely, I really like that analysis of the probabilities adding together. Okay, our next question is in the chat. How would you advise researchers to engage with open access? How would you advise early career researchers? And additionally, would that advice be different for educational or institutional leadership? And I'm also gonna add in here, if you could give like one practical piece of advice for the audience. And let's start with Monica. Yeah, great. Um... I, I, I will sort of preface this by saying that I think practicing in the open is always something that comes with privilege. Um, being able to uh, publish uh, in gold open access, being able to just have the time to put stuff in open access, um, you, you have to be in a, in a position of privilege that allows you that time and that energy to do it. If you are in that position, um, you know, it's, it, hopefully it, then it is incumbent on you to take that privilege to try to make your work more open. Um, and my, uh, my advice would be that you're, you know, you're probably going to, um, you know, face some, some, uh, you know, some challenges and some obstacles. Often that obstacle can be, especially if you're an early career researcher, it can be your supervisor. Um, and, you know, my, you know, my um, advice to you is, first of all, being open is probably the most helpful to you as a researcher. Not only does it make it easier for you to do your research to make it reproducible so you can go back and make changes. Um, there's citation advantages associated with your work as well that may help you in your, your career development. Um, so from, you know, from that perspective, it's useful if even just from like a, a selfish perspective. Um, if you're also driven sort of by that ethical perspective or from, you know, a, a need to make it open, like some of the um, early career researchers we heard from before, I think that's obviously an added incentive. That is why I do, why I work in the open and why I work on open access. Um, but the, you know, the last part to that question is uh, my advice would be to empower yourself with the evidence that shows how helpful this can be to you, especially as an early career researcher, how helpful it can be to publish preprints, how helpful it could be to publish open data. Use that expertise you have to find peer reviewed publications that show how advantageous it is to work in the open and take that evidence to the people who are making it difficult for you to work in the open. So if you have a supervisor who's afraid of publishing the open because they're afraid to get scooped, come armed with evidence to show how beneficial this can be to your career in terms of citations, in terms of um, grants, um, and then again, in terms of just making it easier for you to like execute your research. So that would be my advice to, um, especially to early career researchers. Thank you, Monica. Douglas, would you like to follow up from there? Thank you. Um... In the glam space, I mean, the good news, and I always like to share positive messages in this kind of pandemic moment, um, that in the cultural heritage space, there is actually more open data, more 
very amazing, interesting uh, open access cultural heritage objects around the world than ever before. So um, in the last five, particularly 10 years, we've seen a real progression around that. Um, in a moment, Lily, when I've stopped talking, I'll drop a couple of links into the, everyone's chat here, if that's okay, just to point you to where these things can be found. Um, just to echo Monica's point there that um, if you're engaged uh, as, a, as an institutional or an educational perspective around open access in the GLAM space, um, there is now a brilliant portfolio of case studies, interviews, resources which are available, which really kind of give a, a great evidence base of the effectiveness of open access and how it serves the mission of GLAM institutions. Um, so it's moved well on from being a theoretical concept and a kind of activist initiative. It's there really is kind of solid evidence out there now of why it works and the different ways that it can be can be deployed. Thank you. And Cedric? Um, so very briefly, um, I, I'm not, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not a researcher, but I think um, I work a lot with um, public institutions that uh, sometimes enact legislations that affect researchers. And I think there is a need to have a, a, a change in the normative discourse around openness that lowers the uh, privilege barrier that makes it um, harder for uh, some to engage with um, the open access movement so that is a uh, necessary and there is some positive uh, there are some positive evolutions in, in that uh, in Europe especially uh, where um, European Union funded research projects have to be uh, published openly and there are platforms to do that in a systematic way and in documentation so that's that's good that change needs to um, be reflected within um, in research institutions so uh, we were talking about the leadership. So they are the ones responsible for um, enacting that change. At the level of a, a new researcher, um, I have, I have a junior researcher, I think it's, it's hard to, to enact changes from yourself, except for being a, an advocate, which again, it can be hard uh, because you have a lot of things to care uh, about already. Um, but just, uh, without necessarily focusing on a sort of numeric count of how much things you've made open, uh, because to some extent it will be driven by the normative discourse around uh, you and your lab, uh, but focusing on uh, having these relationships that I mentioned before, engaging with the stakeholders of your research, uh, will naturally uh, put you in a position where uh, whatever you do research, you will be able to uh, improve your processes in a way that um, they incorporate more voices and more uh, angles, uh, and that is or also part of the work of being more open. Perfect. Thank you all. That was really helpful information. We have just a few minutes left, so I have another question, but I want to open it up and see if anybody has a question that they would want to ask. So if you are an audience member and you have a question, please type it in the chat here and give you a few seconds to do that. Okay, I don't see anything, so I'm going to ask my final question. And with respect of time, I'll try and keep this short. That final question is, how has the open access or open research landscape evolved since you first started in this field? And let's start with Cedric this time, please. Okay. Um, so, um, so the um, we. It, so I'm, I'm not so much on open access, but in terms of open data, which to some extent um, includes open access, what, we, what I, I think has evolved a lot is that um, 10 years ago, a bit more than 10 years ago, there was this kind of um, um, global discourse. And I think Monica mentioned that about we, we should open everything. And, and that discourse has become much more nuanced and, um, and also um, there's been a splintering of the efforts um, which is not a bad thing because uh, today in the open data world, there's a lot of reports on very focused areas such as uh, public procurement, such as um, uh, companies' beneficial ownership, um, 
and uh, but also there's um, a lot of um, interesting things around um, um, indigenous uh, data and, and thoughts about, okay, so how can it be made open in a responsible way? Um, so all, all of that, those discussions that were kind of drawn into the massive wave of um, let's change the discourse and let's make everything open um, are emerging now, uh, maybe more difficult to track of because those discussions are all all have a lot of depth and require some uh, contextual knowledge. Uh, but from my um, my point of view, where we work across a lot of fields, that's an interesting evolution that is happening. Yeah, definitely. Douglas, would you like to add something? So yeah, I, I totally agree with Cedric that the in open glam uh, nuance and complexity has grown, which is really welcome because it was needed. Um, the I linked there to the open glam survey uh, just for transparency that I sort of founded and edit co-edit that with uh, my colleague Dr. Andrea Wallace, at the University of Exeter. Uh, three years ago, we started it uh, as a if you like spreadsheets. It began with about thirty items of museums that were open that we knew, and uh, we're almost at the thousand mark now of global institutions of open access. So, yeah, the growth, the volume of open access uh, has increased. The nuance about what open means uh, has, of course, is, has developed as we talked about in this call today. But also the the legal framework around copyright and licensing, um, and this touches on Anne Lee's uh, comment just now has also developed. So within the European Union, uh, by June this year, the uh, copyright and the digital single market directive is due to be implemented into all the nation states. That's important for Open and GLAM because Article 14 says that items which are in the public domain when digitized should remain in the public domain, which has been a real mantra. I should really have that on a t-shirt uh, for years in the Open GLAM movement. So that's really a, a welcome clarification of the existing law. And that, you know, that the copyright legislative change is going, I'm sure, to kind of further accelerate open access in the GLAM space, um, which I think is really needed. So, um, and just to, to wrap up on this um, for Anne, Anne's question that something that I've leaned really heavily on, and it's great to be with you and Open Knowledge Foundation today, is that uh, the open definition and its uh, specific list of conformant licenses and rights statements about what open actually means has been really, really useful. And that has very, um, is very widely used and referenced in the open glam space. So uh, yeah, I guess, thank you for, for, for making it. <laughs> Great. And Monica, would you like to in, or wrap it up for us, please? Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll briefly say again, say from sort of like the science uh, researcher perspective, that I think there's definitely been a warming to open science. Um, when I started, uh, you know, in graduate school, it was something that was, you know, um, very much, uh, uh, you know, something that, you know, maybe some graduate students says maybe one lab did. I'm uh, certainly something that anything that like my supervisor did. So I think there's been a warming to that you can just see that in the number of preprints that are being submitted to, um, to repositories like BioArchive, you know, um, the, the growth of those uh, preprint repositories. Um, but also, you know, just to echo what um, Douglas and Cedric have said, there's also, you know, this nuance and, uh, and a recognition that, you know, we have this opportunity to um, rebuild the way that we do science if it's, and it needs to be done from a lens of, of equity. And there's a lot of great work that's being done um, from, um, uh, people like Leslie Chan at the University of Toronto at Scarborough, who are you know, making sure that when we think about open and we think about rebuilding this, these scholarly infrastructures, you know, to do them in a, in a way that actually does make things more equitable, not just open. Thank you, Monica, that was great. We are out of time. This has been such an amazing panel. And I really appreciate all of your thoughts and your expertise. And personally, I really enjoyed hearing from your different backgrounds and thinking about how these issues are similar across different fields. So I am going to call this to an end. I would like to have a round of applause for our panelists who are very great and we appreciate you. 
I have been attempting to live tweet this discussion. So if you have more questions, please um, you know, check it out on Twitter and or add your own answers. I've been putting in resources that people have been adding. So um, check that out as well. And at this point, I would like to thank our panelists. I would like to thank Caleb and I would like to thank our fellows for participating in this open day-to-day -day event. And I will see if the fellows would like to unmute and say anything here. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. This was uh, super fascinating and uh, it was really great to share, uh, you know, my excitement over open science and open data and uh, hear everyone's thoughts around it. So it's been really great. Thank you so much. I think uh, the, the panel's outlook on open science, especially when it comes to uh, what Monica was talking about, um, licensing for not sharing personal data. I think I never thought about, you know, uh, having like some restrictions on uh, personal data or you know like a checklist of what you think about when you want to share uh, some data so that will be really useful i really uh, appreciate all your outlooks on you know on open data as a whole and open science thank you so much may we have this again yeah bye <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. The, it felt like today we looked at so many different elements of the open universe um, and saw not only how uh, there are shared definitions, but are also very important specific nuances in each field that are really important to take, uh, take note of. And it was cool to see those threads connect, but also to realize that, you know, something that I may be familiar with in one space not, may not necessarily work in another space. Um, yeah, and it was uh, such a joy to be joined by all of you and to learn from all the speakers today. And from, of course, working with my colleague Evelyn Stata as her uh, research assistant. Okay, thank you all again. And with that, I am going to end this call and I hope that everybody has a great rest of your weekend and really enjoy you join, or we're really happy that you joined us on a Saturday. Thank you all so much. Bye, thanks. Okay, I'm gonna close the meeting, bye. Bye. <laughs>